Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Bird Fisher. How Hi. are you today? Good. Thank you for having me on. I uh, basically I wanted to try to be somewhat conversational. Um, you, so, you. Oh, are you not hearing me? Well, doesn't say you're muted. Uh, it says now the host has unmuted your mic. Do you hear me now? There we go. Okay. Yep. Um, so uh, I was hoping to basically be somewhat conversational, so I'm happy to kind of introduce myself and my work, but I hope people can leave questions in the comments because I definitely don't intend to just sort of uh, blab for one hour. <laughs> so uh, to introduce myself, my name is Ford Fisher. I am the editor-in-chief of News to Share, which is a uh, news, an independent news outlet where basically I film uh, activism um, to the extent that I can from usually beginning to end of demonstrations, um, protests, uh, when they turn into riots and so forth, that kind of thing as well. Um, so my work is basically premised on the idea that uh, the mainstream media is inherently um, incomplete in its approach, that uh, the sort of 24-hour news cycle of cable news and so forth uh, kind of necessitates a sort of cutting down of what you see. Um, and I think that that has sort of incentivized um, our political conversations to be uh, overly basic, where we are seeing uh, that there's just sort of two sides, you know, the sort of CNN approach where they uh, throw on a conservative and a liberal and then they just, you know, have the two of them debate and whatever uh, comes out of that conversation is supposed to be truth or supposed to be neutral. And uh, my opinion is that um, that kind of opinion journalism has kind of failed uh, people. And so instead, I uh, go to events, attempt to film them from beginning to end, and I produce highlight reels that just show kind of a, um, you know, a summary of what happened, but where the live stream is accessible so that people can see 
um, the context of every single moment. And I think that that is a format um, that is more sort of useful uh, to the public. I think that in reference to a conference like this, the sort of aspect of uh, what I do that may be sort of interesting is that, of course, I also film the police, which are kind of uh, a constant um, element of pretty much any kind of activist situation. At any given situation, you're going to have different police employing different tactics, um, you know, and if things go wrong, um, then it's important to see how did law enforcement sort of contribute to that problem. And so it's been interesting because uh, for me, I think that there is a there should be an asymmetry in the way that we view people versus the state as it relates to uh, sort of invasion of privacy or kind of recording. And what I mean by that is that I think that there is generally a burden of proof when the state wants to violate somebody's privacy, uh, right, that they've committed some kind of crime or whatever. And so that should be protected. Whereas if the government wants some kind of privacy, I think the burden of proof has to lie on them in order to explain uh, why they uh, should be entitled to that privacy. And so um, just as sort of some uh, examples off of the top of my head, very recently, I actually filmed a uh, what was expected to be a demonstration. It ended up only being three people, but in front of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and a couple of police officers came outside, federal cops, by the way, came outside to tell me that I would have to point my camera in the opposite direction of the building, that that because of their uh, security duties, they would have to uh, prevent me from filming. And so the situation sort of turned into a um, First Amendment audit, as I think a lot of people um, call it, where basically you challenge a police officer on attempting to stop you uh, from doing videography. and. Um, so in that particular case, I pretty much tried to stand my ground. They ultimately went inside and said, we'll go a different way then, and then didn't come back outside to do anything about it. Uh, happy to send the link to that to anybody who uh, asks for it, but it's but it's publicly online. And I think generally over six years of recording activism, um, I think that that conflict is something that I have uh, generally experienced um, where where I think that there's a natural strife um, between media that doesn't actually serve the state, right? So you have, I, I would say that a lot of the mainstream media basically parrots the opinions of the state or cover what the state says is acceptable to cover. Um, but to the extent that media is independent from influences like that, I think that there's a natural strife uh, between the state, such as police, agents, you know, whatever, um, and uh, a free press. I mean, in the most extreme, um, I've heard of journalists having their door kicked in and so forth for access to uh, video. But I think that there's kind of a natural conflict there where I am um, confident in saying that I try to be objective in my approach to journalism. And I don't uh, consider my journalism to have a anti-state bent. I don't think it's particularly uh, sort of biased, but I think that there is sort of a natural uh, strife, um, which has brought a, um, I think, audience to my work that might not go to mainstream media. People who watch my content are probably uh, frustrated with the nature of mainstream media. Um, but uh, also frustrated with those exact sorts of problems, like where the media is not uh, covering those things which the state tells them tells them not to. Um, so I I actually don't see any comments yet, but I'm not sure if I actually have uh, visibility to them. I would uh, appreciate if I could get some kind of guidance on um, if there's a way to actually access or sort of see uh, what people are um, saying going into this. Yeah, so far we haven't had any real comments or questions. Okay. I mean, we've had comments, no questions, but definitely we'll keep you updated on that. Fair enough. What what have I gotten so far? I guess I was trying, <laughs> hoping to be a... Uh, yeah, no, it's mostly just deal. people thumbs upping and checking out, um, you know, checking out the uh, panel so far. So we're definitely okay. that. Um, well, so I guess if I'm, if I'm going to just continue on what went what's happened more recently until until or unless somebody has something to interject. Um, I had signed up for doing this talk uh, quite a long time before this occurred, but I'm guessing that the thing on the top of people's minds right now, news-wise, that I actually covered was the Capitol insurrection on January 6th, 
Um, so I'm happy to chat about that and the sort of social media censorship and so forth that followed from it. So, of course, as we all know now, um, you know, on January 6th, President Trump gave a speech in, um, you know, at the Ellipse uh, right next to the White House. And uh, by the end of that day, uh, Trump supporters had attempted to uh, or did storm the Capitol in an attempt to um, postpone or prevent the certification of the election. And uh, of course, they delayed it by hours, but didn't sort of meaningfully change the course of that certification. And if anything, what they accomplished was getting Trump uh, impeached uh, two times. So that was a historic, um, you know, change that they affected. Um, so I think that the maybe the point that I haven't gotten to talk enough about, but I would have uh, certainly done so um you know, uh, more conversationally as the comments come up and whatever, is uh, the element of how uh, social media corporations, how the big tech corporations have kind of replied um, to independent journalists who are actually there. So on that day, um, I was not able to live stream. I, I generally am, but on that particular day, way too many people are in Washington, D.C. at the same time. And so um, my videography, I kind of tried to imitate, imitate the style that I would create through live stream being as uh, complete as possible, um, you know, while presenting the story. And so at the beginning of the day, I actually did film the president's speech beginning to end. And as he was talking, I really got the impression that this was going to be a critical moment in history, that what he was saying was completely unprecedented for um, a president to be saying in advance of what is normally a sort of procedural situation, the uh, certifying of the votes, that, um, you know, that basically he wanted ad activists to uh, prevent it. And so while he did say that uh, on one occasion that basically it should be done peacefully with respect for law enforcement, um, throughout the speech, he was sort of riling people up. And I think that the interesting thing for me was that in some cases, even when President Trump was not, um, you know, using terminology related to fighting or violence, that as he was describing the fraud that he felt was affected against him, people were chanting, uh, fight for Trump, fight for Trump all around. And so whether somebody supports Trump's impeachment or not, or has any particular uh, feelings about the president, my um, purpose in documenting this in a beginning to end way was that this is obviously a contentious um, and historical moment. And so I filmed from beginning to end my perspective of that speech where I was in the middle of the crowd, not right up near the president and filming both what, uh, you know, is coming across the projector, the giant screen that people are watching uh, Trump speak on, but also the people around me. And so I filmed that full uh 70 minute video. And so I'll circle back to that, but that's kind of the part one. And at the end of his speech, he said, and now we're all going to march down uh, through Pennsylvania Avenue uh, to the Capitol to make our voices heard and so forth. And so I, my video then, my, I, my second video chronologically that I then published was the actual march itself, going the, the people moving from the uh, White House area toward the Capitol. And then finally, upon arrival at the Capitol, I arrived right after the very first barriers had been broken. And my understanding later was that uh, Trump supporters had actually uh, toppled the barricades and pushed forward to get to the Capitol um, before the speech had even ended. And so I had basically, as soon as the speech ended and Trump instructed people to move, I ran with them. Um, you know, filming uh, filming that actual march take place and then filming them arrive at the Capitol, those people who had been called. But people who were there before the speech even ended did the first the first sort of um, de-barricading of the Capitol, if you will. Um, as time went on over the course of, you know, the next several hours, I was able to film uh, the violence that took place. I did not go inside the Capitol, but I spent a lot of time at individual entrances that Trump supporters were pouring in and out of. And um, I am fortunate, I believe, to have, I believe, not witnessed any of the actual fatalities that took place on that day. I witnessed what I would say was uh, some of the most considerable violence that I have ever seen um, in person. But at the same time, I did not actually see the uh, any of the deaths that happened. So I'm grateful for that. But um, when the night concluded, when I got home, I cut together basically a 22-minute uh, video that showed 
the just raw footage of how the Capitol insurrection actually took place. And so I had a total of three videos, uh, the speech, the uh, marching to the Capitol, and uh, then what happened at the Capitol. And what was fascinating to me and what has kind of uh, brought me into controversy of late is that that first video chronologically, the 70 minute Trump speech was actually uh, removed um, from YouTube. And so I have been struggling with YouTube about this uh, for a while. And YouTube took down the video on the night before uh, the House delivered the articles of impeachment to the Senate. And of course, the articles of impeachment, I'm sure everybody who is watching this knows this, but uh, Trump has been impeached on one article and on one crime, if you will. And that crime is uh, incitement of insurrection. And so my footage uh, from January 6th that YouTube then removed um, on the night before the House delivered uh, the impeachment article to the Senate um, shows the exact people that the president allegedly incited at the moment that he allegedly incited them. And YouTube took it down. And YouTube took it down claiming that it spreads election misinformation, presumably because of the words that the president said in it, right? YouTube established a policy saying that basically claiming that the election had been um, determined that Joe Biden won because of fraud, uh, because of massive amounts of fraud, dead people voting, et cetera, um, that such things would be deemed disinformation and not allowed on YouTube. And in my case, of course, I made no such claims. I made no claims at all. I simply showed exactly what happened when the president spoke to people on that day. And so the problem, of course, is that YouTube is pretending to be so dense that they do not understand the difference between uh, footage of somebody uh, propagating a theory and seeing its outcome and one's own YouTube propagating that theory themselves. Um, so I kind of went back and forth, uh, or I shouldn't even say back and forth. At first, they, I wasn't getting any response. I contacted them. I can, tried to contact them for a while, uh, publicly and privately, both trying to reach out through private channels as well as tweeting, uh, sort of advocating about this issue and getting the attention of some news outlets. And finally, they replied to me saying that the reason that they took down my video is that it didn't include a countervailing view, that their problem was actually that it's okay to talk about or show videos that um, describe Trump's unacceptable point of view, but only if uh, you have a uh, counter view also demonstrated. And of course, I tried to reiterate, I had no view whatsoever. Uh, my video was simply showing literally what happened um, and not making any claim about the efficacy of Trump's claims whatsoever. Um, but in spite of that, I would also point out, and I think that the thing that was more frustrating to me was that many news outlets broadcasted his entire speech and similarly had no additional context or countervailing views. Um, but I think what's also frustrating um, is that as it relates to raw video, the inclusion of something to counter raw video that shows what happens is taking video that is as close as can be to truth, right? As, as journalists, right, the objective should be to get as close as possible to objective truth, realizing that when you convert anything into medium, there's always subjectivity to it. Which direction are you pointing the camera? How do you edit it? Whatever. So for me, trying to put out the entire video is the closest I can get to truth. But for them to say that you have to add something else, a commentary, uh, you know, somebody else's perspective is to take a situation which I have recorded truth, and it's basically telling me to add something that is non-truth to the video in order to make it acceptable. And I think that this is emblematic of the exact problems that I have with mainstream media, where CNN uh, is not just showing you what happened, they're telling you what to think about what happened, or they're giving you two different people with opposing views of what you should think about what happened. But fundamentally, they're still just giving you people with options about what you should think about what happened rather than trusting your audience to think for themselves as, as I basically do. Um, as I continued to advocate about this, they actually ended up demonetizing my entire channel, not just that video that they had removed or something like that, but they demonetized the entire channel 
And I, of course, made a bigger fuss about that online, which led to uh, it was actually Fox News that wrote a uh, story about it. Um, and uh, ultimately, they remonetized me and then sent me an email explaining that they had had some debate among uh, the sort of staff, the people actually working at YouTube who deliberate these issues, um, but that there was no uh, outcome to that uh, in terms of it changing. So I, I was remonetized, but they did not uh, want to restore the video because they viewed that it, uh, it as not having a countervailing view. And so something that I did then and then twice since then that I truly... Uh, regret that I think is very unfortunate that I've had to do is actually show my own face in the video, right? The way that I am talking to whoever is watching this right now is actually not what you would really see when you watch my work. Um, I've thought about some, maybe doing a live stream, like a QA and a type of thing. But generally speaking, my work, my coverage of events doesn't really show me in it. It's raw video that I shoot or that my contributors, when I hire people, shoot. And it just sort of shows uh, you know, what happens. And so I resent that I had to um, put, put an introduction where it's me with my face as a disclaimer saying, you know, if you want to see the opposing side, uh, you can go check out this link. And, um, you know, basically I described the exact same disclaimers that YouTube was putting on election related content. And I literally said, Sin since YouTube needs an opposing view, here's YouTube's view. Uh, I hope that suffices. Basically, please don't take the video down. Um, but I found it remarkable that uh, while my footage was actually shown in the impeachment manager's presentation at the impeachment this week, um, which is a huge sort of contribution to history in my mind, not that they asked me or that I contributed directly to it, but that the um, impeachment of an American president actually included video off of my YouTube channel, right? I mean, that's a that's a huge, um, you know, humbling sort of thing to see. Um, but at the same time, uh, people need to be able to access the originals. People need to be able to actually see uh, the context of what is being um, shown to them. So uh, with that, I guess I would ask again, are there any new uh, comments or questions on any of the forums that you have this uh, streaming to? Um, yeah, there actually was a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> folks were curious about, you know, you get accused of both being, you know, uh, of having, you get accused of basically having politics on various different sides of issues. I've seen you be accused mm. of being alt-right. I've seen you be accused <laughs> of being Antifa. And it seems that folks are curious, like, how do you respond to those accusations when they happen? And how do you navigate that mm -hmm. as someone who just tries their best to show objective truth? Right. So um, that's a good question. So to, to sort of restate it in, in my own um, words, or as I have seen this problem, um, I think that most uh, press nowadays, and this is part of the problem, by the way, that I try to actually solve by doing what I do. Most press today uh, sort of presents themselves as leaning to one side or another. If you read a Daily Caller article, you are going to assume that even if the article is not explicitly biased in some way, that it is being written in a way that got at least the approval of a conservative news station, right? And if something makes it onto air on MSNBC, similarly, people might assume that either it is biased or people who are biased still allowed it to make it to air. Um, and so I try to be the solution to this problem, right? I try to actually shoot in a way that I think is as close to non-bias as possible. And by the way, I do have my own political beliefs. I think there are probably uh, people in the community that would participate in this uh, very conference who um, may have a vague idea of what my own um, political affiliation is. I am a member of a political party, although I tend not to say what party that is on broadcasts like this, but people could look it up if they wanted to know what my personal political uh, viewpoint is. Um, with all of that being said, I try to be aware of the way that I, that, that my politics might guide me and then, and then try not to um, have that inform the way that I talk about things um, with all of that in mind. So some people I think really try 
to actually box people into their political, what their political agenda must be. I think that this has been the mush that, um, that the mainstream media has made out of people's brains, that they have to basically assume that every media must be trying to guide you in some political direction or another. Um, in my case, I do try to cover various political factions. And I do think that politics is a lot more complicated than two different sides. Again, as anybody watching this conference surely knows. Um, but so I've had people who have accused me of being on any given political side. And the problem, I think, the, the thing that's frustrating or difficult about that for me is that um, because I record uh, what's going on and my questions to people tend to be, um, I would say, challenging, but certainly not... Um, against somebody, right? So I, it would be quite common for me to, uh, you know, ask somebody, you know, what would you respond to? You know, I talked to the counter protesters and they tell me X, Y, Z, how do you respond to that claim? Right? So I might ask somebody a tough question in that sense, but I don't really take an adversarial stance toward anybody while I'm filming. I'm doc, I'm trying to document what happens and I'm not trying to actually change what happens by frustrating them. And I'm not trying to shape people's opinions of people by making them look stupid, by making it look like they can't hold their own or whatever. I'm trying to actually just document what do these people think? And the thing that that has caused is that on occasion when I'm covering a right-wing event, I think most people who see me covering it know that I'm not trying to show them any kind of favoritism if I'm just showing what happens and then asking basic questions. And then the same thing with the left. If I go and film an anti-fascist event and uh, interview them and so forth, you know, so people will then accuse me and say, oh, well, how come you didn't get beat up by the Antifa? You must be a leftist. Or on the right side, how come the right-wingers let you in there and you didn't ask them tough stuff? You must be on their side. And so I think that there's this underlying assumption that everybody has to be approaching um, a situation that they're covering with some kind of preconceived politic. And it makes it so that it's really hard um, to, uh, you know, get convince people out of that. And so, you know, when people, when somebody claims this, right, um, it's often because I've never found, I've never found that somebody believes that I am biased toward their side, right? Um, you know, so so if uh, if a conservative likes me or if a leftist likes me, they tend to be like, oh yeah, he's really he's really objective. He shows everything the way it is. You know, like I show up at a rally, I film the rally, the person watches my coverage after they're like, yep, that's that's pretty much what happened, right? Like my content is pretty hard to uh, dispute. But a lot of people believe um I think based on usually their own biases that that trying to be objective is actually a preference for the other side. And so there's and there's a distinction that I want to make here. I, I keep using the term objective and I'm not sure that I've defined it. And I want to be extremely clear that it's very different from the term neutral. Right. So I, I sometimes hear people say, oh, journalists should be neutral. And I actually disagree with that strongly. Neutrality, in my mind, is taking two or more sides of a situation and implying their equivalence, right? So neutrality would be to, uh, you know, take there's there's one side that that has one opinion. Um, let's say that it's the universal basic income or something, right? So you know, you have Andrew Yang's side. Let's give everybody one thousand dollars a month uh, from the government, no questions asked. And then there's another side. Uh, that says, no, we shouldn't do that. That is a bad idea. In my opinion, an, somebody being neutral is basically going in there, interviewing both sides and saying, these are both equally valid, right? <laughs> um, whereas for me, I'm not making a claim of the equal validity of two sides. I'm simply showing what any given side who shows up to something says. So if there are two sides who show up to a situation, I do try to speak and show uh, what both of them are saying and doing. But if one side shows up to a situation, I am not trying to uh, you know, then reach out to somebody who would oppose their viewpoint to then get something to balance it out. I'm just documenting what actually happens. I think that what CNN tries to model itself off of when they do what I've kind of used as this example of like, they have on a conservative commentator and a liberal commentator and they're like, ah, yes, what we have is truth. This debate is truth. Those, I think those people are being 
neutral, right? And I do actually believe in the, I've heard many variations of this quote, but the the idea of, um, you know, neutrality in a system of oppression is taking the side of the oppressor. I actually agree with that line of reasoning. And it's one that I think sometimes um, people will attempt to level at me saying that some other side is doing wrong. And so if I'm just being showing what they're doing without, without condemning them or saying, or actually using the words like they are bad, that I must be siding with them. And so the distinction I would make is I'm not attempting to be neutral. I don't claim the equivalence of the various groups that I cover, I think it's important that in order to analyze them, in order for anybody to explain why they are not equivalent, um, you have to actually first start with truth. You can't have reason without truth. You can't have understanding without truth first. And so for me, I try to be objective and just show what happens. Um, And then I am sometimes accused by one side of being the other side. Ways that this is actually, you know, shown up in my life, by the way. Um, I was actually at reco- uh, recording at a Proud Boys rally in Portland, Oregon um, in September. And before the rally started, a militia guy uh, came up to me. This is somebody with a gun in his uh, chest holder, holster. Uh, came up to me and he said, you're going to have to leave because we have we have intelligence that says you're Antifa. And I was like, excuse me, what? And this went back and forth. It was about a seven minute argument where I was trying to explain like, no, and what the heck are you talking about? And this is a public park, uh, you know, on top of all of that. So even if I was Antifa, um, I would certainly not be uh, able to be prevented from being somewhere and filming something. But but nonetheless, the accusation was baseless and sort of and ridiculous. Um, and ultimately it was diffused when a Proud Boys leader actually was the one who told him like, no, that's not true. He, he actually first jokingly said that it was true. And then he was like, no, no, it's actually not. Um, and so they backed off. Um, on the other side, I've actually seen it much more online, um, where the political left in some cases will, uh, say the same thing that by, uh, filming right-wing people that I'm platforming them. I am, that's a common accusation. And so the, the, or I actually, I shouldn't say it's common. It's the, it's the most common that I've seen when it comes from the left is the idea that if you film, uh, people, um, that you might be propagating their opinion and that that in itself might be dangerous. And so I actually do have a view of platforming, but I, but I think that it's a different perspective than people who would criticize me on the basis of that term. So for me, I, I don't, really invite people to come speak like on my platform. It's very rare that I arrange an interview and I go and shoot it somewhere where I wouldn't find somebody normally. Right. So, um, you know, I think that when Joe Rogan or, uh, uh, Dave Rubin says, Hey, would you like to come on my podcast? Would you like to sit in my chair in my studio and speak into my microphone so that my audience can watch you? Um, that's creating a situation. I'm not saying it's always wrong to do that. I'm saying that is, that's an artificial situation where you actually are literally giving somebody a platform. You're giving somebody a microphone, uh, when they would not have otherwise had it. I think that that's what platforming is for me. I don't, for the most part, I very, very rarely do that sort of offsite interview. And if I do, it's usually very connected to something that's happening, um, sort of physically in real life. So for me, when I go out and film something, I'm actually, I tend to record something that would already be happening. So I may live, I may in my live stream, I may in the course of my conversation, interview somebody on field, right? Somebody is doing something. And then I go over to them and ask like, what are you doing right now and why? And that explanation, um, perhaps somebody could argue is platforming them in a way, but I think it's actually an essential part of documenting them to get them in um, their own words, why it is that they are saying or doing the things that they are saying or doing. Um, and of course, showing the things that they would be saying or doing, regardless of whether I am there or not. So all, all of those things, I, I don't think of as platforming on my part. Um, but there is a criticism, I guess, of my work uh, that exists, which says, if you even document what somebody um, is saying, then you are sort of platforming them or propagating their views. If that's true, then I certainly do it to both sides. Um, but I but I basically disagree with the uh, 
core essence of that problem. So I hope that that answered the question. Happy to take a, another one if, uh, if there are any. Sorry, I was smoking. Um, no worries. Yeah, no, it, uh, people were curious about what kind of experiences that you've actually had filming with anti-fascist groups and mm -hmm. just whether the media hype around it actually holds up or whether it tends to be more fake news. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are the, uh, the first thing that I guess I would say about this, because um, there, there's a million things that people could talk about about Antifa, um, anti-fascist activism in general. The first thing that I would say about it is that um, while there are Antifa groups and Antifa activists, there is no single thing called Antifa, right? There's not a monolithic national uh, or international, for that matter, organization. Um, it tends to be organized in um, sort of local chapters, organizations, collectives is often the word that they use. And and uh, even within those particular uh, collectives, they often uh, organize more based on affinity groups where you know some people are interested in one thing and some people do a different thing, whatever. The point that I'm making by saying all of that is that uh, the values and tactics of, of Antifa groups uh, vary from one to the other drastically, right? So um, the situation that somebody might witness if they were to cover um, anti-fascist organizing in Portland would be drastically different than the way they would see it in Washington, D.C. And so I am based in Washington, D.C., and I would say that I have a ability to cover their Antifa movement that I don't in many other places. So the places that I have covered anti-fascists more frequently, I think that they have a more close understanding of my work, whereas um, somebody seeing it online who doesn't actually know my work as well might not um, assume that sort of until I talk to them. But I do, I think some things that I do that have um, that have made it smoother to be able to cover uh, subjects like that include that I actually tell people before I go to an event that I intend to cover them. So just fundamentally, people have a right to film in public, right? You, if Nobody can tell you otherwise, not a cop, not an activist, nobody, not a politician. Um, but at the same time, there's a viewpoint uh, among some on the left that says that sort of being filmed is requires consent. And while on a legal from a legal perspective, that's not true. Um, I do think that there's sort of a social um, uh, politeness, I guess, that might come with telling people in advance, I'm going to be there, I'm going to cover this thing. And similarly, you know, while you certainly have the right to sort of film somebody's face, I don't make a point to like go into people's faces. If people say, hey, can you not film me? Um, unless their name has the word senator at the beginning of it um, or officer, <laughs> then, um, you know, then, I, then I'm generally willing to try to sort of be polite about that. And so to the anti-fascist groups that I have covered, um, with especially those with a great deal of frequency, I haven't really had issues, um, but I think largely because they understand my sort of good faith uh, method of reporting, that I'm not there to attempt to sort of get them in trouble, be it with the police or be it by making them uh, look bad by cutting down footage in a way that, that makes them look bad. I think that part of the perception of them being um, changed is that on the one hand, the, the I would say, center left to more leftist media um, does not tend to want to emphasize uh, really much of what, or I guess I shouldn't say leftist media, the center left media, the mainstream center left media, so N NBC, CNN, MSNBC, and so forth, tend not to want to show them at all because they actually don't really fit um, media narrative, right? They don't fit into the two party perspective because they are uh, based, they tend to be anti government. Um, they tend to uh, have views that don't align with the American center left. For example, they're pro-gun. They sometimes show up to things with firearms, as is their constitutional right to do. Um, and they don't like Democrats. They don't like Joe Biden, right? <laughs> On the night of the uh, election, I filmed uh, an anti-fascist protest where they were saying, 
no Trump, no Biden, no fascists, no presidents, right? That was their viewpoint. And so I don't think it fits sort of into the American mainstream media center left uh, to talk about them. On the other side, on on sort of right-wing mainstream media, Fox News and so forth, um, they've sort of blown up Antifa to be sort of a boogeyman, where Antifa, it is true that Antifa does violence. It is true that Antifa sometimes believes that initiatory violence against government targets or against property, um, which they would not view as violence at all, uh, is justified for some cause or another. But the inability of any of the mainstream media to cover the things that they do that don't break windows, I think has caused people to believe that all they do is break windows, right? So I have I have covered demonstrations that they've done that don't turn violent where they're advocating a position. I've filmed Antifa press conferences, um, but the reality is the mainstream media just tends not to be interested in those things. And so I believe that I present a more balanced view by showing um, as much as I can the entirety of the types of activism that they do. And of course, I'm not perfect at this. I can't cover every single action that they do. Um, but I think that most Americans are left with sort of a warped view where it actually makes sense to me that many Democrats have come to this idea, oh, they don't exist at all, that they're completely a myth. And that would make sense if your media doesn't talk about them whatsoever and the right-wing media only turns them into a boogeyman that's like a way bigger deal than what they are as far as the actual... Um, Violence, or I shouldn't even say a bigger deal, but a more that that if you were to watch Fox News, you would believe that all that they do is commit violence, which which is not the case. And so um, I believe that my type of media is actually a pathway to understanding that movement better. Um, and it's unfortunate that the mainstream media doesn't follow suit. Yeah, I mean, honestly, even just in my experiences, we've crossed paths in the in the past. I mean, for those who were unaware, I very much ride the line between a lot of left libertarian and right libertarian circles myself. Mm -hmm. I've seen you cover both fairly objectively. I mean, you came down to stone mountain with us mm -hmm. um when i was part of redneck revolt and you very much you know i think we all had a mutual respect for each other in that right um, and so and that was an anti-fascist demonstration that um to people who don't know what we're talking about this was i, I assume you're talking about february 2019 right yes yeah so to people who don't know the situation um being described the there was an a planned, like, I guess I would call them white nationalists, kind of like, I don't think that they used the term Ku Klux Klan, but like former Klan members who certainly had not disavowed um, their their white nationalist positions. Basically, white nationalists and neo-Confederates were going to be marching on Stone Mountain Park. Uh, if you're not aware of what that is, I would encourage you to look it up. But basically, it's the Mount Rushmore of the Confederacy. And so there was a coalition of leftists that formed um, I would say that, so that was called the uh, Flower Coalition. From memory, um, something, something to working to end racism. Darn, I can't, now I can't remember the, the beginning of it, but, um, but it was working to end racism was the were in flower. Um, something organized into whatever. Anyway, there was a coalition formed of many different groups, including Redneck Revolt, um, various socialist groups. I believe there was a DSA chapter that was involved as well as An Atlanta's Antifa group. And uh, they ended up doing a march that had uh, a considerable number of people armed, but not all of them. And they marched to uh, basically celebrate the fact that ultimately the neo-Confederates canceled. They didn't end up having their event. And so this march was sort of a celebra celebration march and surrounded with... Um, armed leftists who were uh, protecting it in the event that there was any kind of an ambush or something like that, um, which of course never materialized. Um, they uh, set fire to a effigy of a Ku Klux Klan uh, kind of member. Um, and I, if I recall, there was actually buttons inside of it. Uh, so it was sort of like a pinata as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I, in covering the event, I mean, it was a li like I've described, it was a live stream beginning to end, and I was able to interview people um, 
at the conclusion of it, since then there have been situations there that I filmed that have turned violent. Um, but um, I think that I guess it's I guess it's interesting because that's the sort of situation that I think that you would not find uh, on the mainstream media, where uh, you had ar armed leftists um, who were carrying communist and socialist flags, by the way. Um, and so none of that and and then doing direct sort of community self-defense and basically not wanting the police to help them in any way in in so doing. Um, I think that basically every element of that goes against mainstream media narrative. And not that I was trying to film it in order to just say, ha, gotcha, this isn't what the mainstream media would imagine. Um, but, you know, I think that my coverage of that was very popular among people because I think people really do want to see what happens. They do want to understand it, but the media is never going to show it. For the left, it doesn't go with, or for, again, the American center left, like NBC and so forth, it doesn't go with their narrative whatsoever. Armed armed Antifa, right? Ar armed leftists, communist flags, none of this goes with uh, their messaging. But for the right, what does it mean, right? For a Fox, what would Fox News even do with that? Uh, you know, can that the that these far right individuals didn't show up because leftists showed up with guns. The the Fox News is not going to get anything, um, you know, out of a story like that. And so I think it's actually a really good example of um, how I've covered the Antifa movement. Again, I think that it would probably be too broad or too simplistic to just say it was an Antifa march, but but essentially it was. It was an anti-fascist coalition. Um, and so it is interesting actually to be talking to you now, um, knowing that you participated in that then. Yeah, I remember one of the more interesting uh, comments that day that we had gotten from you was that we were one of the few armed marches that you've ever covered where you weren't getting flagged by yeah. armed protesters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and again, that, that really was not meant to be a political observation. I mean, just to be clear, I mean, I've now I think that the the prevalence of firearms at protests in general has gone up quite a bit, and I have been indeed at um, demonstrations where I felt quite uncomfortable with the manner in which people are holding guns, and I've and I've seen that on every every political direction. Um, in the year 2020, by the way, I have been at two situations that had accidental discharges. Um, so I am not uh, certainly not fond of people who are not competent with the firearms that they. Um, bring to events. But on that particular day, uh, I did point out um, that uh, in, in my observation, I actually did not see anybody who seemed to be carrying a firearm that they were not um, experienced with. Like I didn't see anybody sort of handle it in a way, had handled them in a way that would imply that they were confused by them. And I did, and I did notice even in one, on one occasion, there was somebody who walked by me who had he simply walked by me with his firearm at the same direction that he was walking, then he would have briefly flagged me to people who don't know what that means. It basically just means when a gun is inadvertently and usually momentarily pointed at somebody, but he actually adjusted the muzzle to face it more down such that the gun wasn't pointing at me at any moment. Um, I was a little, uh, I think salty on that particular like time period because a month earlier I had been at a pro gun demonstration in Pittsburgh and there was a guy who had um, what I believe was like a Mosin, like it might have been like a Russian rifle. Um, but uh, I, as I looked at the video later, it, the bolt was actually like open, so it, it would not have been ready to fire in any event. But there was an individual who had a rifle um, pointed downward, like it was strapped to him on the front. And he wanted to apparently adjust it to be on his back facing upwards. And so in so doing, by cycling it like that, he had to convert it to go like this and then up. And he actually did point a gun like straight at my face. Um, again, just for a moment, not because he was trying to assault me, but it was while I was interviewing somebody and I saw and I looked for a second down the barrel of this gun and I like, <laughs> I actually ducked. And the person I was interviewing turned around to look like what what happened. Um, it was so quick that that person didn't even notice it. But I mean, I guess the thing I would say is, you know, it takes it takes one moment. It takes a, a millisecond for somebody to be killed uh, making a mistake like that. So anybody who's watching this and has any uh, ideas about going to a demonstration with a firearm, uh, I would say uh, you should be extremely well 
um, well studied on the use of that firearm and just generally the rules of firearm safety. We had a D live question earlier. Um, what kind of safety precautions do you take when attending these protests, especially when you're talking about uh, facing armed protesters and other such things? Sure. So I do own two bulletproof vests and a ballistic helmet. And so on occasion, I do go out in a uh, style that might look something um, like a, 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 a SWAT journalism, <laughs> right? Like um, where I'm where I'm wearing bulletproof equipment and so forth. Um, but that's actually not the best move for everything. I think that sometimes I've gone out to demonstrations and I see people like a little overdressed and not that it necessarily signifies like amateurism, but I think that there are other factors to think about, such as what kind of weight are you physically putting on your body if something is going to be in motion? And also, are you possibly subjecting yourself to um, greater uh, kind of criticism from, from police, right? So in Washington, D.C., for example, technically, there's nothing actually illegal about body armor, but um, police have tried to use it as a reason to hassle people, like saying, like they in my opinion, feign ignorance about the law and pretend that you don't have a right to wear it. I've filmed this happen to people multiple times where police have given people grief about that kind of stuff. And it is also, I think it's hard to prove, but anecdotally, it is my feeling that people who are dressed more militaristically in riot situations sometimes actually become the target uh, more so by the police. And so, I mean, during the George Floyd riots, for example, of May 29th, 30th, and 31st, in Washington DC, I was shot um, with a uh, with pepper ball rounds twice. These are basically like um, sort of like paintballs, uh, except that when they burst, when they when they hit you, they burst, and it's an effect like um, pepper spray. So I ended up with welts in my body where they hit. Uh, but then I, the second one, which hit me in the shoulder, which hit me basically right here, uh, left me like blinded for about ten minutes. Um, so that sort of stuff. Uh, I think is actually mitigated by not wearing as militaristic looking of stuff. So I tend, for example, not to wear a bulletproof vest in Washington, D.C., but I do wear it when I go to an event that has a lot of firearms and a place that has a much more protected uh, status for wearing body armor in the first place. So, for example, I've been to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, I think five times in 2020, all for armed demonstrations. And I was wearing, uh, you know, bulletproof equipment on those occasions. The things that actually I would say for people are probably more useful is um, I do tend to always carry in my backpack a um, pair of goggles and a gas mask. I think that although it is relatively low risk, if there's no reason to think an event is going to escalate into tear gas and so forth, um, it's a relatively, uh, it might be something that's a low risk uh, issue, but at the same time, it's it's really not burdensome to carry those devices because they're so small, right? Wearing a bulletproof vest to something that you don't need to be wearing a bulletproof vest to could cause you to get dehydrated, could cause you to get targeted, uh, could uh, make something worse if you end up in some kind of a legal situation. But um, a gas mask, especially during coronavirus, a gas mask and goggles are both good things. The other thing is people, I'm not wearing my like hat right now, but if people, if people are familiar with my work, they may have seen me wearing like a ball cap. And I actually have a lining inside of it. It's what's called a bump cap where you line the inside of a hat and it has an effect like a small helmet. Um, and so I tend to wear that sort of a clandestine hat. It doesn't look like I'm geared up for any kind of violence, like the way that someone might perceive it if you're wearing like a ballistic helmet, but it does provide some protection, uh, you know, when I get hit in the head with something or another. Um, so those would be some basic uh, techniques. The other thing I would say is just be well well identified as press. Um, unfortunately, you can still be targeted in spite of that. Um, you know, indeed, uh, I was shot in the head with a rubber bullet, right, square in the forehead on May 31st at the George Floyd protests in Washington, D.C. And, you know, I had a large broadcast camera on a tripod as well as a press credential. Uh, but in spite of all of that, it still happened. So, uh, but with that in mind, having something to identify yourself as press, and even if you are independent press who doesn't have access to somebody actually issuing credentials, uh, it is still perfectly 
uh, normal to self-issue in order to identify yourself as press. So that's also something I would recommend. I would also like to mention that uh, the Industrial Workers of the World is doing a panel on Sunday and their freelance journalist and will give you will give journalists press passes if they need them. So right. uh, we I definitely I am, encourage free speech on that. I am aware of them and I and I and I don't want to create any kind of like I don't want to say that you shouldn't, but I would just say the thing yeah. that I'd be very careful about if you are going to get an IWW press pass is that um, they are perceived as leftist. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to cover an event on the right and you're, and that's what your press credential is, um, I have seen this happen where Proud Boys will say, you're not real press and the person will show their credential. It's an IWW credential. In my opinion, it doesn't matter what like your, your opinion is, right? You, people have a right to record and the right to record is not derived from having a legitimate credential. The credential kind of just is a way of signifying kind of understanding somebody's role. But in any event, as it has turned out at right-wing events, I've seen people be accused of being Antifa press or fake press because that's what their credential is. So while, while, while I have nothing against them and I think that that's a good thing that they make that available, I would just be cautious about the implications of wearing that to an event where you could be targeted for wearing something like that. I would suggest that it's also very easy to join and similarly get a credential with the um, NPPA, the National Press Photographers Association, also gives out credentials basically just by paying a membership fee. Wonderful. That is that is great to hear. Yeah, definitely. Because I completely agree. Having, <laughs> you know, seen how the IWW gets targeted and also just not everyone may agree. Not every journalist may agree with their politics either. So, like, it's right. not, you know, I'm not trying to offer that on there. I'm just trying to offer that as, you know, one of the many ways you can get press credentials I, I would if also you're an independent that, journalist. Uh, I would also just add that most cities have some kind of authority that issues them. So this varies from place to place. Uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., I have a congressional press pass. You basically can only get that if you're spending, I think, more than half of your time covering Washington, D.C., uh, in New York, it's actually issued by the NYPD, which, frankly, that sucks, right? I don't think the cops should determine who's press and who's not. Uh, but they're actually working right now to change that. The city council in New York is trying to change that. And some friends of mine are actually involved in attempting to reform that. But so, you know, I could, I'm could i not going to list off every city by city, but I would also say you can make one yourself. You can get them issued by an authority like NPPA, or as uh, you pointed out, IWW, uh, or you can also just see what's available in my area. That's wonderful. And uh, it looks like we're about five minutes away um, from our next panel. So where can folks find you online? Where can folks follow you? Uh, cool. Follow your work, all that stuff. Sure. So my name is Ford Fisher. I think my name is displaying right under my face here. So that's convenient. Uh, Ford is F-O-R-D, Fisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R. Um, on Twitter, I'm accessible at Ford Fisher, same spelling. Um, and my platform, my business is called news to share That's news, the number to share, one word. And so that's news to share.com news to share on Facebook, and news to share on YouTube. Um, if you want to support my work directly, um, I also have Patreon, patreon.com slash Ford Fisher. And the profile on that Patreon account is news to share I have also... Um, Recently, uh, because of issues of YouTube censorship, I also now have Odyssey and Minds, which are both sort of alternative social media platforms um, that uh, have sort of been backing up my YouTube channel. So if you're uncomfortable following me on any of the various uh, sort of mainstream social media uh, platforms, any of the big tech, then uh, Minds and Odyssey are options as well. And I believe uh, Minds also, or sorry, Odyssey also backs up to library as well. Right. So uh, it's sort of complicated and I'm not uh, enough of a computer scientist to understand it perfectly. But my understanding is that Odyssey is sort of a 
um, funky front end to library, which is the system that actually does it. So I think that, you know, I don't think I had to go onto library.com to actually like make it happen, but I set up my channel to back up all of my videos automatically to Odyssey. And to be clear, not just back up like as a file, like people can watch my videos now, all of my videos that I put onto YouTube, you can also watch on Odyssey uh, at this point. And that is, and that happens, I think through the system called library. Uh, but you should definitely ask somebody else if, uh, you want a more technical understanding of that. Cause I'm probably misdescribing it. No, I think you're describing it. Well, Odyssey and library, you can access it at both. So definitely right. go check out Ford's channels on library Odyssey. You said YouTube and what was the other one? Uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Odyssey, Minds. Nice. Wonderful. <laughs> and we are huge supporters of alt tech here. So definitely glad we here are streaming live now to D Live, as well as unfortunately Facebook and some other mainstream <laughs> platforms. But hey, you got to drum up some audience. And if I, well, I could leave you with one parting thought actually on that subject, which is that. Um, for me, people sometimes say, why don't you just do alt tech because of the issues of censorship? Right now, my my whole Twitter is marked as sensitive. Facebook has banned and unbanned me three times, always admitting the mistake, but I mean, it still happens. Uh, YouTube frequently takes down content, demonetizes all that stuff. Um, the reality is I think it's still important to reach everybody, right? And so whether you're an activist or whatever else, I, I do think that Facebook, YouTube, Twitter are the platforms where you reach the whole population. And so alt tech, I think, is a great thing to add to that. But I think it is still worth uh, trying to fight for a free and equitable uh, platform on those mainstream sites. So I do both. That's kind of where I'm at. I couldn't agree more. And that's where we're at with this festival as well. So right. do you have any parting thoughts for independent journalists? Yeah, I guess I would just say anybody can do independent journalism. I think that I've kind of laid out an ethic of exactly how I do it, but I happen to be sort of talented in video and I don't think of myself as, you know, a profound writer or something like that. And so I would say, you know, you can make your own code about it, right? It doesn't have to look like mine. Uh, don't let anybody tell you you're not a real journalist. Um, you know, find your code, find your ethic and uh, you know, experiment with it and do it and be prepared to defend it and be prepared to change your model if uh, people make persuasive arguments that your model is the wrong one. Um, but I would say just do it. Don't wait for uh, somebody, a network to hire you. Uh, you know, you have a camera, you have these platforms, you have the ability to do this stuff. And actually you don't even need a camera, right? If you have a, if you have a pen and a piece of paper, uh, you can, you have the beginnings of starting your independent journalism career. So um, I would just say anybody who wants to uh, feel free to reach out to me. I try to be really accessible. So if people do have questions um, or want advice about how to do that, I'm very happy to talk to them. Awesome. And again, people can reach out to you on Twitter and where else? Uh, so Twitter at my handle below. Um, uh, so that's at Ford Fisher. And then um, I'm also on Facebook as Ford Fisher, but my platform is there is called News to Share. Um, and uh, my email address is also accessible on my website, news to share.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ford, for joining us here this Mardi Gras. Great. And thank you for having me on. Awesome. Well, definitely support independent journalism, y'all. That is absolutely one of the most important things we can do as activists that pretty much is the way we get most of the things that we do done because we cannot organize without people knowing what we're doing. Right. So thank you so much for joining us, yep. Ford. Thank you for inviting me on. Thank you.